We get to celebrate wonderful things about our Heavenly Father today. And uh, Father's Day is one of my most special days, not be because uh, of being a father, more in that we get to celebrate our Heavenly Father. And each and every one of us can understand and get that. I'm away from my kids right now, and so I get to celebrate them and being a dad to them tomorrow, which I'm really excited about. And uh, we have some plans, and so I'm, I'm uh, going to do some pool time tomorrow with my kiddos, which is one of my favorite things to do with them. Uh, I have two kids. One is eight, one is four. My daughter is eight. She's just a wonderful little girl. She's so full of love and life. I've always uh, just been infatuated with her. Uh, she's just stolen my heart. I love everything about her. She's just a very special little girl and filled uh, with really a sense of wonder and amazement. She's just very similar to me. It's amazing how that happens. We have a son, and he's very similar to his mommy, while our daughter is very similar to me. And uh, we've been, uh, just over this last few weeks, we've been together, spending some time together. We did some vacation together. That was fun. And uh, my kids got to stay up late, much later than they typically do go to bed. So 10 o'clock is uh, pretty much uh, the latest uh, that I let them stay up. And they got to spend every night going to bed at 10 o'clock. But my son, he, he tends to get up at 5 a.m. It doesn't matter what time he goes to bed. I don't understand that. My daughter has learned the value of sleep again. And um, that's a that yes, she's a good daughter. Yes, but uh, he he likes to get up and and uh, he loves to spend. We spend a lot of time in the morning together because of that. Because um, I'm te I tend to be the morning person in the family. And uh, but but uh, my son is just nonstop, and and my daughter is just full of grace. My son, he is more of a uh, he's more of a a physical, uh, physically demanding child. He likes to wrestle. He's a constant wrestler. And so it's a wonderful thing raising these two, and you get to learn about the father. And over this last uh, two years, really, or last, I would say last year and a half, I've really gotten to know the father. And for many of us, we may not recognize it, but we are going through different seasons of our encounter with God and encountering different aspects of the Trinity. We, we know He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so when we come to Jesus, often we come not being saved by Holy Spirit or not being saved by the Father, but being saved by Jesus, of course, because He's our Savior. And we, we fall in love with Jesus. Jesus is everything. And we love Jesus. And, and He's on every single word that we speak and. We love Him because He is just the embodiment of love. He's perfect love. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's everything. He has filled us, saved us, redeemed us. Jesus says, whoever is forgiven much loves much. And so you, send, uh, you start loving Him with all of your heart because of what you've been forgiven and how deep your, uh, your pardon was. It's changed everything. And you start to fall in love with Jesus and, and you just see Him everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And then there's a point in your relationship with God where you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a different aspect of the, the nature of God. He is uh, God on the earth and He's moving. And He is fully God, yet He's a part of the Trinity. And so... We get filled with the Holy Spirit and something begins to happen to us. We get filled with the power of God. And we're empowered and we feel power and we, we understand that God is powerful. And He's our Savior first and then we start to be filled with power. And now we're no longer powerless because we, when we're powerless we needed a Savior. But when we recognize we need a Savior then He can trust us with His power. And He puts power in us by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes and we start to recognize God is powerful and and power is something that I feel like all of us desire some of us secretly desire 
Others are open about it. We have a longing for power. Some of us are a little intimidated by power. We may, we may think absolute power corrupts. And, and so we try to stay away from powerful people or powerful situations because we in some ways feel powerless. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He says, I will give you power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. And so we get power to be a witness to the resurrection glory of Jesus. And there's a power that uh, some of us, we understand that. Other of us have a shaded past with power. Maybe a gun was how you felt power. A gun in your hand. You, you felt like, wow, I'm a powerful person. And, you know, life can change uh, when, when you feel power and you can do something, uh, something terrible when you feel power or you can hurt people when you feel power. Others of us, we uh, have been a victim of powerful people and yet God wants to fill us with his power and it's a different type of power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a holy power and it changes everything. So you start to get brave and you get courageous and yet you... At some point in your walk, power is not the most powerful thing in your walk. The most powerful thing changes, and it's no longer just power, it's love. Love becomes the most powerful thing in your life. Love becomes the motivational factor. It becomes the thing that motivates you and keeps you going. It becomes the thing that that you long for, the feeling of love. Some of us feel loved. Others of us, we know we're loved, but the feeling comes and goes. And yet, whether we feel it or not, we can believe that the Father loves us. And that's really who the Father is. The Father is love. John tells us in 1 John that God is love. And perfect love casts out fear. And so we look at Jesus, He's our Savior. He's King. We look at the Holy Spirit, He's the power of God. And we look at the Father, He's the love of God. He's love. He is fullness of love. And the love of God was displayed for us by sending His Son. And He sent His Son to demonstrate a father-son relationship. He sent His Son to die on a cross, and through the cross of Jesus, we get to see the love of God. The love of God, it says, was shed abroad in all of our hearts through Jesus. And so now we're filled with the love of God. We get to experience God's love, the Father's love. And yet, Jesus had to experience some of the things that we experience in our life, the lack of love. We may not realize it, but Jesus experienced lack of love in his life. Not just lack of love from others, but he experienced a separation with the Father on the cross. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He actually called God his Father. But when he came to the cross, he changed his description of God as Father to my God, my God. I believe, and I would propose to you, that Jesus came down, experienced the Father as God so that we could experience God as Father. He experienced Him like you and I may have grown up to know Him. He's God. Some of our views of God need to change. Some of our views of God need to metamorphosize because we've been living out of this understanding of God that is more... He's more like a taskmaster, and he's, he's trying to control the universe. But when I've seen the Father, I've, I, I've recognized that he's perfect love. In fact, I've seen the Father, and he's, he's like a big, giant Jesus. That's what he looks like. <laughs> and he's perfect. But he is so full of love. He's so full of love. And so I want to talk to you about the Father right now, because I believe for some of us, We may not know what the Father is like, and it's limiting in our 
it's, a, it's literally impairing us from living out our full potential because we've not understood God as Father. We've understood Him as God. But Jesus came to reveal God as Father. He came to reveal God as Father. He came to bring us to the Father. In fact, when Jesus comes back and all things are put under His feet, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that at that time, all things will be brought under the feet of Jesus. Everything will be submitted to Him. All the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He will present all the kingdoms to the Father. He will present everything to the Father, and the Father will rule. And it's, a, it's something that we tend to miss in our understanding because for most of us, Jesus is enough. I believe Jesus is enough, but Jesus actually being enough came to, ex- to describe to us and, and proclaim who the Father was. And they said to him, show us the Father. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he and the Father are one. He is the brightness of the Father's glory. He is the exact representation of his nature. And so when we start to understand that God is Father, our life will change because we'll no longer think of God as a taskmaster. We'll start to understand the ways of God and move as sons and daughters. Are you ready for this? Go to John chapter 5. I've got something out of the scripture, and then I believe people are, there's some people needing ministry in here tonight. It says this in John chapter 5. We're in verse 1. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It says, by the sheep gate, there they are. The sheep are gathered. There's a bunch of people there. The sheep gate in Jerusalem, there's a pool called Bethesda in Hebrew, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir up the water. Then the first one who got in after the water was stirred up, recovered from whatever ailment he had. Now, could you imagine? They're all sitting around waiting for some kind of whirlpool effect. They're looking and watching, waiting for the water to bubble up. Something was going to happen to this water. And it was a sign to them that an angel of God had stepped down and stirred the water. Now, they believed that At this time, whoever got into the water and was the first one to step into the water would be healed. And you had to be there at the right time, at the right place. You ever been in a situation where there's only one of something? There's a bunch of you, but there's only one of something? It'll put a scarcity mentality in you like nothing else will. I remember when I was a kid, my brothers and I, uh, my, my mother would come home with one cereal box. Believe me, we all knew where that thing was. One cereal box. I don't care what kind of cereal it was. We were cereal fanatics. We knew where that cereal, because three boys, one cereal box. The law of supply and demand. We need that cereal. And sure enough, my brother, who was the middle child, my brother, he would run down. I was the oldest. He would run down and pour himself a bowl. He wasn't even hungry. He would do it because he wanted to have something that everybody else wanted, right? And I would say, you just ate. Why are you doing that? Save it. I'm the responsible one. I'm the oldest, right? I'm like, save that cereal, man. And then my little brother, who's the youngest, he would come down, and he was sneaky. He would hide the cereal. (laughs) He'd hide the box. I'd look around. I knew he did something to that cereal. I'd look, and sure enough, 
Remember when Tupperware was like the biggest thing, right? Mom comes home with Tupperware containers for days, right? Everybody's into Tupperware. Well, we had an entire cupboard of Tupperware, and he would put it way behind the Tupperware, hiding. There it was behind the Tupperware, that cereal. I found it. I found it. But when I went to pour it, it was empty. I'm like, what? This is not fair. Cereal. The law of supply and demand. When you know there's only one of something, it becomes of greater value. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm in Nashville right now. They have a pancake house there. People line up for hours to get in this pancake house. Pancake pantry. Pancake pantry. Yeah. Anybody love pancakes? I'm a big pancake fanatic. Pancake pan Now, here's the thing that they, that they do, though. Because I remember lining up at the pancake pantry, getting in there. I'm like, I'm going to get a pancake. And you psych yourself up for these pancakes. You, you may be on the Atkins, but you are like, I'm not going to, I'm going to eat pancakes until my brains are filled with pan I mean, like, my ears are, I'm going to eat pancakes. You're excited, right? And you're thinking chocolate chip, banana, banana pancakes. They got syrup, blueberry syrup, maple syrup, other kinds of syrup, pecan syrup. You're like, I'm going to get me a pancake. And things begin to, everybody's getting hangry. You ever gotten hangry? It's a mix between angry and hungry. You start to get hangry. You want to eat the pancake. And you're, you're, you're looking at other, oh, going to get my pancake. And then you get in there, and the place is half empty. It's like a, one of those Disney World rides you just sit on for hours, and it ends up being a 30-second ride. You're like, what a ripoff. <laughs> this place is half empty. They control the lines. I'm giving away... This is like probably going to be deleted from the podcast, I hope. Because this is like Wizard of Oz type stuff. You get to behind the curtain and see really who it's going on. And you go, oh, it wasn't so powerful. Uh, you know, because they control the line. So it makes it look like there's, there's a lot of people that want one thing. Isn't that awful? But you don't care. By that time, you've so psyched yourself up that you want the pancake. They're like, give me 10 pancakes. You want to eat the pancake. And so it's an amazing thing. Everybody is looking at one thing. You want one thing. And everybody's waiting for the stirring of the water. The angel is going to come down and stir the water. The chances of that have to be miraculous because I don't think that there's, this was like, you know, at 5 o'clock every day or 4 o'clock every day. It's not like a timed thing. It was like people would wait around for this one supernatural event and it was kind of like lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. When is it going to strike? I don't know. And the odds of this thing, you know. So people are waiting and you have to understand this scenario because what Jesus is about to walk into is a man that had been sitting there for 38 years waiting for the stirring of the water. It says, one man who had been there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he knew he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? I've been in situations where people are on the verge of, of a breakthrough 
And it's as if they don't want to get well. They don't want to get well. I've been on the verge of breakthrough with some folks, and it's as if their identity has been infused with disappointment to the point where the Scriptures say, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You ever wanted something for such a long time? And it's, and it's almost like it's a carrot dangling on a stick in front of you. You can't reach it. It's just right out of sight. It's so close. It's right there. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When the heart is sick, you start to get disappointed and you start to become sort of jaded about life and possibilities. Things, you know, when, when you hear about things going on, good things with other people, your life happens, uh, happens to them. It happens to them. And you start to get jaded, you know, and you almost get to a point where you don't want to hear about a breakthrough. Have you ever been in that place? I've been in that place where I've been so hungry, yet I, I've let my hunger get the best of me, and I get into hope deferred. And somebody will come in and start telling me this wonderful story. They'll tell me, and I'm like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I, I, I mean, they're like, oh, my gosh, it was amazing. This conference was amazing. And I'm just I can't hear it. Because I'm so hungry, I've got to hope to hurt. I've got to, I've got to tend to the garden of my heart, because that hope deferred can create a culture of disappointment. But I want to prophesy over you today that God is removing the disappointments from your life. He's removing disappointment, and He's bringing you out of hope deferred into divine appointment. God wants to bring you out of hope deferred into a divine appointment. It says when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Well, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When the desire comes, it's a tree of life. It's a sustainable, life-giving source. And God wants to cause your hope in your heart that you've lost to be restored back to you. The desire would come back into your heart. Do you know what this word desire means? Desire is an interesting word. Desire. It means of the Father. Of the Father. That God wants to put inside of you good things that are born of the Father's heart. That God has plans for you. Good plans to give you a future and a hope. He has good plans and He wants to Set you up for success to the point where your every day becomes a divine appointment. Your every day is shifted out of a place of suffering into a place of abundance. Somebody say abundance. abundance. So Jesus, he comes up to this man and he says, do you want to get well? Have you ever been in that situation? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? You know you're in a situation where you're just feeding that little frenzy in your heart of hope deferred. You're overloading on chips, sitting there on your, on, on your, on, on, on your bed. You're like, I'm not going to get up for days. I'm not, nobody's going to see me. And you, you kind of hide, you cave out, and you have that little voice that says to you, get out, go do something. You're like, no, I don't want them to see me. Do you want to get well? No, I don't want them to see me. I'm going to be in here all by myself. I'm going to be in here. I'm going to hide out. I'm, going to, I'm not going to let them see what I'm like right now. I, you know, psh, forget them. Forget them. You've already been there long enough. You've already been there too long. Do you want to get well? And you're in a situation where you're like, God, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need someone to come to me and, and do some divine intervention. 
You ever been in a moment where you need divine intervention? I've been in a moment with some people that needed divine intervention in their life. I had one young man, he was, in div- he was in a moment of crisis, he needed divine intervention. And I looked at him in the eyes and I said, you're not a loser. And he said, I am a loser. I said, you are not a loser. He said, I am a loser. I said, no, you're not. He goes, I can't do anything right. I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And he said, I can't do anything. I, 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 can't, I, I can't apply for a job. I said, why can't you? He said, because I don't have a car. And I don't know what was compelling me in that moment, but I was so motivated by the height of this moment. And I said, well, I'm going to give you my car. He said, I'm a what? What, 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 what did you just say to me? <laughs> and I'm telling you, he started drying his eyes. And he was like, whew, man, this is amazing. This is the best day of my life. One minute he goes from loser to next minute he can overcome anything. He said, where are your keys? I said, they're right here. They're all yours. I had to explain it to my wife. (laughs) We're a one-car family, baby. One-car family. (laughs) He got in that thing, (sighs) fired it up. He was excited. Within that week, he got a job. He got a promotion. That company made him a regional manager. This guy couldn't, I'm talking about he couldn't get a job. You know, he couldn't get a job pushing a broom at Wawa. This guy, he was, and all of a sudden, things shifted in his life. He became something to someone because somebody believed in him. Somebody believed in him. He ran around with that car until... The company that he was a part of bought that car, or bought him a car. He had a car. He had my car. He gave that car away. (laughs) He was doing so well, the company came in and bought him a car. He rolled up in this brand new car. I said, what's this? He said, the company bought it for me. I said, where's where's the other car? (laughs) Well, I was blessed to be a blessing. (laughs) I'm sitting there going, praise the Lord. I'm praising God with you. Somebody believed in this man. He says, do you want to get well? Sir, this sick man answered, I don't have a man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. You ever been in a situation where somebody always gets in right before you? It's like you're waiting and waiting, and and, and you're, you're waiting for something, but it seems to me that you... To, that you just, it's, they, they get what you're going after. And you're like, I've been here longer. I've been waiting longer. You're in a, I mean, I have friends around me, super gifted. And I'm like, God, did they fast for that? They fast, God? I fasted for that. (laughs) 
God, what? Someone gets in and gets ahead of me and gets what I'm going after. You, you've been in this situation before where you're going after something and someone seems to get the promotion that you've been going after. Someone, someone seems to get the job opportunity. They, someone gets the scholarship. Someone gets this or gets that. And you're sitting there faced with a dilemma. Does God got my back? Does God have my back? But it's an interesting moment because this man, though he... He, he looks like he needs a savior. This man needs something else. And Jesus is about to do something for this man that I believe you and I could tap into today as part of the new covenant. Jesus looks at him while he's complaining about his miracle. He's missed the miracle. And Jesus says to him, get up. Get up. Turn to your neighbor and say, get up. Get up. Now, somebody in here needs to get up. Somebody in here, you're in a situation where you need to get up out of that situation and trust that God has put it in you to overcome the situation that you're in. You might be between, be between a rock and a hard place, but God's going to work a miracle as long as you get up. Some of us have been pushed down, pressed down. You're busted. You don't know where to go, but it's not time to let go. It's time to get up. God wants you to get up and stand up in that place where you've been struggling. You don't know where Jesus is, but he's saying over you, get up. Now, you, know, you may not be used to that. I want to just tell you, get up. Because somebody in here, you may not be used to You may be used to someone speaking over you. Bless you in Jesus' name. They may be speaking over you. Healing in Jesus' name. You know, that's all important. Jesus, you know this, this, that Jesus doesn't pray for the sick man. Jesus doesn't pray for the sick man. He doesn't say to the sick man, be healed. Legs work. Back be straightened. He just tells this man... In this situation, who's been there for 38 years, his hope is deferred, his heart is sick, he doesn't know where to go, he can't get into the water because somebody else is getting what he's asking God for, and yet he tells this man in this dire situation, get up. Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Somebody in here needs to pick up your mat and walk. Now you have to understand something, this man, Jesus... He's, he's saying this, pick up your mat and walk, thinking that this man has walked into this environment with a mat. How did he get his mat here? <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> You're going to get up, but I want you to sit down. Where there is a will, there is a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. Somehow, this man in his crippled state has found a way to get his mat to some pool at, at, in, in some sheep gate area. He's found a way to get what he needs to where he's going. Where there is a will, there is a way. Sometimes our excuses are the biggest thing limiting us. We've been limited by our excuses, and our biggest enemy is not the devil. The biggest enemy can be our own mind. It says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Take every thought captive. When you have a, a mindset that is toxic, anybody ever had a situation where you feel like the mindset that you're dealing with in this person is toxic? It's like they can't, they can't do it because they don't believe that they're, they're, they're valuable enough or they're worth enough. 
They, they are in a toxic mindset that is keeping them debilitated and keeping them from walking in the fullness of what God has called us to. Someone say, well, shouldn't Jesus just heal this man? You know, sometimes we've actually already been healed, but the problem that we're dealing with is nothing more than a phantom problem. You ever had a phantom problem? Phantom problem. Anybody ever had phantom phone calls? Phantom phone calls. You know, I, I, there was a season in my life where I had my church made my phone number available. People were calling me and texting me, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, pray for pray, Pastor. And I, I just, I love those moments of being prayed for by uh, being, you know, be able to pray with people. But some situations, you know, were just a little strange to me. Pastor, please. Um, I mean, I love you guys. You guys have the real heart of pastors, you know. I know you're more than that, but, you know, true pastors, people living in your house, people living with you. Me, I'm like, I want my own room. I want my own house. Yeah. I mean, God bless you guys, but it's a holy calling, okay? That's, it's not for everybody, but it's, you know, people can do it. And, uh, and, and, and you guys have love. You have an unbelievable amount of love, and, and I'm, I'm probably growing in my love. You know, people, pr pastor, come pray for my house. Pray, pray. I'd say, what's going on? The cat, the cat is messing up my carpet. I'd say, Psh. get rid of the cat. I'm going to give you a few simple steps to this pastoral coaching right here. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I have a cat. My, my kids have a cat, so don't worry. I'm not a, I'm not a cat hater. Somebody be like, that guy hates cats. <laughs> no. <laughs> my, I, you know, I was in situation. Pastor, please pray. I said, what? My carpet. Ill do we? I don't know if I should move or not. I'm like, yes, move. Do what you got to do. I don't know. I don't need a word from God about this. Do what you have to do. You know, and some people are looking for, you know, some kind of divine intervention. We're looking for a divine intervention. And yet, some of us were experiencing problems and pain that probably doesn't even actually exist. In reality. But I remember when I was in this moment, I was getting phone calls and I was getting them all the time, text messages, you know, and people nowadays have about five different ways of connecting with you. If they can't reach you on phone call, they'll call you on, they'll, they'll Instagram you. People, I just got the other day, somebody actually called my Facebook. I don't even know how this happens, but I, my Facebook started ringing. And, and I was like, no, no. It's about, you know, too many different ways of connecting. And, I, and I, I remember going to this resort. My wife and I, we went to this resort. And they said, sir, we want you to really relax. We want you to really enjoy yourself in this vacation. We hadn't been on a vacation in a number of years. And she said, uh, the lady behind the counter, she says, we want you to really enjoy the vacation. Can you, would you like to check your phone in? We provide that as a service. Yeah. Get up, David and Tracy. <laughs> Come out, phone. Tracy, I was like you. I was like you because I, I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> they try to take my phone. I'm like, no. No, are you kidding me? I need this thing. 
It needs me. <laughs> so a day into it, I realized, you know what? I can relax. I don't need it. So I start putting it away in the safe inside of the hotel room. I'm like, I'm going to lock this. Not because I'm paranoid somebody's steal it. I'm, I'm paranoid I'm, I'm going to have easy access to it. So I'm like, you know. And so I put it in there, and, and, I, and I go outside, and I'm, I'm with my wife. We're by the pool on the beach. We're enjoying ourselves. All of a sudden, I'm like, I got a phone call. <laughs> what the? There's no phone. I was getting phantom buzzing. <laughs> phantom text messages. And you hear like a ringtone that's very similar or some kind of sound that's very similar, and you also, What? It's like a baby crying. You're like, my baby. My baby, where are you, my baby? I have to answer you. And you can't get this thing in time. So you're like, wow. And it, 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 you have to detox these phantom messages, these phantom you know, phone calls. And some of us... We're in the situations that are actually not really happening. We think we're in trouble, or we think we're in financial situations, or we think we're about to get fired, or we, we think our family's going to leave us, or we think we're, you know, all these different situations that are phantom. They're not actually happening. The battlefield is the mind. And you have to war over those things and take every thought captive. Now, here's what happens. This man, he's sitting there, and Jesus says to him, take up your mat and walk. Now, I have to say something about this. This man had found a way to get his mat there. Now, Jesus is on the Sabbath. He's already irritated the Pharisees. And one of uh, the things that you were not allowed to do on the Sabbath was actually pick up your mat and walk. You were not allowed to carry your bed from one place to another. They would consider that work. In fact, Jesus, he did several things knowing that they considered this work. Though it was not in the law, he just looked at this thing as, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of traditions of the elders. He would call them the traditions. You make the word of God of no effect through your traditions. And so one of their traditions was you were not allowed to make clay out of spit and, and dirt because that would be considered making clay or brick uh, work. And you were not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. So what does Jesus do on the Sabbath? He takes that blind man and he spits into mud and he makes clay, he forms clay, forms an eyeball in his hand sticks it in that man's eye socket, and the man can see. Jesus does these things on the Sabbath because they don't understand the Father's nature. They think that the Sabbath was something that they had to live for. But Jesus came and said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Do you understand this? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He didn't make up things against you. He made them for you. Some of us are being held hostage to things, thinking he made this so that I, oh God, I got to serve this Sabbath day or I've got to do this. But it's not made against you. It's made for you. Man was made not for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It's made for man to rest. So Jesus is actually about to display the Father. Now, you have to understand something. Jesus is about to heal a man on the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. And he's about to do something so prophetic in nature that we could actually miss it, though it's hidden in plain sight. It's so prophetic in nature. Sabbath was a day that you were not allowed to do anything. And... The pharisaical leaders would, would rather have you crippled and passive than you moving and active because that would satisfy their tradition or their way of thinking more than someone active and fully alive. They would consider 
passive, crippling immobility, holy, rather than someone alive, healed, well, and walking as holy. So Jesus is about to heal this man, and it's really a public display of a prophetic message to all those around that he's trying to convey something about the very nature of the Father and demonstrate who he is specifically on this day. Are you ready for this? Some of us, we don't realize, but we have permission to be awesome. I want you to tell your neighbor you have permission to be awesome. Now tell them, go ahead, go ahead and be awesome now. You have permission to be awesome. Some of us, we're like, God, speak over me. Tell me, when will I be awesome? You came today for a prophetic word. You're like, please, God, have Jamie call me out. Tell me, when will I be awesome? I want to know, God, when? When? I want to prophesy over you, declare over you, right now, you are called awesome. And you have permission to be awesome. Some of us think the gospel is about permission. We think that God is about permission. That every prophetic word is finally permission to do what was in our heart to do. We're waiting for permission, but the gospel is actually about forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that you need when you do something that you shouldn't have done. And the gospel is all about mercy and forgiveness. And we started doing this at a church where we changed our, 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 our culture from a culture of permission to a culture of forgiveness. People were asking us all the time, hey, can I this weekend, do you think that I, could I get permission from you, pastor, to go out and feed the homeless? I'm like, mm, let me pray about that. Yes, of course. You have permission. Why would you even ask that question? Well, I just wanted your blessing. Yes, I get it. You want my blessing, but God already blessed you to be awesome. You didn't need my permission to be awesome. You didn't need the pastor's permission to be awesome. I'm not talking about you grabbing the microphone. I'm talking about doing things in the world. Well, I, I just didn't know if I was okay with you. And I said, look, this is a culture of forgiveness around here. If you do something that you shouldn't have, we'll come to you. We'll tell you, and you'll ask for forgiveness. <laughs> but just keep being awesome until you need forgiveness. <laughs> yes. Come on. I was like, I don't want to micromanage your awesomeness. That's not me. I want you to be who you are. And if you mess, mess up, there's forgiveness. If you make a mistake, there's forgiveness. You know what we had happen? Oh, well, I won't even say it because I could get in trouble here. But it was, it was so much fun. <laughs> People were starting health groups and people were starting all these different groups and, and ministering to the city and doing things. And I would go, I don't even know what's going on. And people around me were like, well, you as a pastor, you need to know what everyone is doing. I said, no, <laughs> please. I want to know less. I just want to show up on Sunday, to be honest. You have permission to be awesome. 
This man was sitting there 38 years in this same situation, needing someone to give him a permission to be awesome. He says, get up. He doesn't say, be healed. He says, get up. Get up on your feet. Take your mat and walk. He doesn't need a healing. He needs to know that he can do it. He needs to know that he has the permission to be healed. He needs to know that he has the permission to get better. Some of us were like, I need to go through 10 different levels of this and that and 10 weeks of healing of this and blah, blah, blah. No, you have permission to be healed right now. You have permission to believe God right now. You have permission to believe. You You don't need a prophetic word from me that you're going to be this, that, or the other. You don't need a prophetic word that you're going to be all. You are awesome. The prophetic comes to identify what's already there. Not to tell you something that you don't have. It affirms what you already have. So there, there's a change because the Father's nature is you are awesome. You're made in His image and in His likeness. You have permission to be awesome. Jesus says, stand up, get up, take up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Instantly, the man got well. Now, here's, you ever been in a moment where you go to sleep, you fall asleep, it's like 9 o'clock at night, maybe you're, Bedtime's a little earlier. Maybe it's 10 o'clock. I don't know. Let's just say you go to bed at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. It's, it's close to midnight. <laughs> You're like, mm, I've got to set my alarm. Thank you, Jesus. Set my alarm. <laughs> Praise God. Set my alarm. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a five-alarm guy. I, I set five alarms. Five alarms because I need to prepare myself to wake up. <laughs> 11 o'clock, you go to bed. All of a sudden, you wake up. You wake up and you're like, oh, my gosh. I slept through my alarm. Oh. What happened? You're running through the house. Oh my gosh. Get up. Everybody get up. We got to go. We got to go. It's 1130. I can't believe we slept. Oh my. I've been sleeping 12 and a half hours. What is going on here? I, I'm, oh, I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. And you're running around. You're, you're like wired. You're like, wow, that was a good night's sleep. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I'm late. I'm going to get... And, and you realize it's not 11.30 the next day. It's 11.30, 30 minutes later from when you went to bed. You're already dressed. You're running around. You're making coffee. <laughs> 30 minutes later. You ever had that happen? I've had that happen a couple times. And... and, and, and all of a sudden, you were like alive. I mean, you were like ready to take the day. You're like, whew, that was a good night's sleep. And all of a sudden, now you're like, oh, my gosh. Whoa. Whoa, I am so, I'm about to faint. I'm so tired. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Please, everybody go back to bed. Everybody, back to bed, please. Please. Daddy's sorry. Daddy's really sorry. Please. The mind. It's a powerful thing when you believe something to be true. When you believe it to be true, you, it changes everything. Changes everything about your, your genetic makeup, how you present yourself. 
It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It says about those that went in and spied out the land, we were grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in the sight of the giants, grasshoppers. How you believe about yourself, how you perceive yourself, if you understand in your heart that you powerful, some of us don't realize how powerful we are because we, we are still thinking that we're powerless and God's got all the power. God, I can't do it. Only you can. Yet he says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Some of us need to begin to declare that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I was in a situation where I was playing tennis with a good buddy of mine. We were weeks into this match. Every night we were going to the same tennis court. It was a public tennis court. And I'm not great at tennis, but I'm competitive. And so I had, we bring this roll of quarters because the lights required quarters. You'd stick quarters in the machine and all of a sudden the lights would come on and we'd play tennis. We'd start off at 7 o'clock at night, end up going to about 10, 11 o'clock at night, sometimes midnight. We'd just play and play and play. Three weeks into the match, and this guy has beat me every night. I am, I am upset. I'm going to win. And I'm sitting there going, God, I need a win. I need a win. I can do this. And he pitches me a soft serve right over, and I'm like, I got this. I rush the net, and when I rush the net to, and I stop, I roll my ankle. And I break my foot. And I'm in such excruciating pain. I'm like, ah! ah! I'm crying. I'm ah! And he runs over. He's like, what? I was like, I broke my foot. I broke it. And he goes, let's pray. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name. I got up. The thing is pain, painful. I can't, I mean, I can't move it. But I had to play. I had to. I am not going to let this foot stop me from winning. Come on. Happy Father's Day. And I'm sitting there, broken foot. I got this. I got this. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to pick up my mat and walk. I'm going to win this thing. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I won. (laughs) But when I was running on that foot, every time I felt pain, I was like, not today, Satan. Not today. And as I ran on that thing, it got better. Until I was pain-free at the end of the night, and it wasn't swollen. I woke up the next day, and my entire foot was black and blue on one side to demonstrate that it had actually broken. It had actually broken. And uh, it was completely covered. I mean, but no pain. I walked on that thing, and it was absolutely amazing. Say, why did you have black and black? Why, why didn't just Jesus just heal that? Well, remember Jesus at the resurrection? He still had holes in his hands after Jesus had been raised from the dead. But it was to demonstrate that, that he would actually, this actually happened to him. Some of us, we need to get up. Some of us need to get up. You have permission to be healed. You have permission to walk. You have permission to move forward. Keep moving forward. Jesus, look, this is the icing on the cake here, and then we're going to pray. Jesus says this man, after the man was cured, did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. They asked him, who told you you could be awesome? They actually said, who told you to pick up your mat and walk? Like, who told you you could be awesome? Who told you you could do this? Who told you that you could get into that university? Who told you you could get that job? Who told you 
you could do that. Who told you you could have a family like this? Who told, who told you that you could do all this good stuff? Somebody got inside of your head. Somebody got inside of your head and, so, and said you could be awesome. But Jesus, he slips away into the crowd, and it says after this, Jesus found him in the temple complex said, See your well, do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. This man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Who told him he could be awesome? Who told him that he could pick up his mat wall? Who told him that he could be healed? It was Jesus. And what was this man's sin? It's an interesting thing because the more I look at this, it wasn't that this man was a liar, a cheater, wasn't a thief, he wasn't in adultery. He wasn't in any of those things. His sin was the sin of passivity. Jesus brings life to this man and shakes him out of his passivity. On the Sabbath day, on the day of rest, and he, I, he identifies to the Pharisees that the day of rest is not a passive day. There's nothing passive about the day of rest. He says, my father has been working. He's still working, and I am working also. There's nothing passive about rest. There's nothing passive about the father's nature. It's active in our life. And so they actually began to pursue him, trying to kill him all the more, because he actually said this interesting thing. He said, my father, and they... They were so irritated by this statement. It says not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So when you begin to understand the father's nature, suddenly this thing begins to make sense. What was once held over people's heads, the Sabbath, now he, he's resembling and displaying the father's nature that the Sabbath is not, is not something that was there to hold people hostage. It was to set people free. None of this thing will make sense until you understand the Father. To, I mean, it'll all be performance. It'll all be, it'll all be striving until we see the Father. Do we see the Father? Jesus is trying to show who the Father is. On the Sabbath. He says my father is working. And I am working also. I don't believe Jesus w received. Like. Instant text message. Play by play type things as he went. Jesus wasn't a robot. He was fully human. He wasn't a robot. He wasn't receiving father instructions. Every moment going. Do this. Pray for this person. Take a left. He didn't just hear some voice say, now stretch out your hand. Now speak this. I don't believe that that's how Jesus operated. I believe he knew the Father's nature. And because he knew the Father's nature, he knew the comfort zone he was operating in. He knew that, oh, there's a sick person. I, he didn't need to go, is it your will, Father? No, because the name of the Father is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals you. He didn't need to go, oh, is, is it will I cast out this devil? No, he's the Lord who delivers you. The Father's nature is deliverance, freedom, abundance. People are being robbed, oppressed, broken. Where does Jesus operate out of? Out of the Father's nature. He doesn't need to Worry. Some of us, we get hung up on, do I have permission to do this? Do I have permission? Because we're so worried about the will of God. There's a difference between the will of God and the nature of the Father. The will of God has become something that we don't realize is actually for us, not against us. Right? Right? We have this mindset on the will of God where, like, we say, God, I'll never go to Africa to be a missionary. 
And all of a sudden, God's like, all right, make them do that. Or, um, you know, we, we, we kind of have this mindset of the will of God. God makes me do things I don't want to do. But when we start seeing the nature of the Father, suddenly the equation has changed. I'm no longer worried about, okay, God, tell me the blueprints. I'm not worried about that anymore. I'm focused on people. I'm focused on ministering to people. I'm focused on touching people with the Father's nature. Oh, my gosh, you're broken. It doesn't matter whether I'm in Africa or Maryland or wherever I'm at. You're broken. You're hurting. I'm going to touch you because the Father's on me. He wants to minister. You've been beat up. Don't worry. I don't need to pray whether it's the will of God or not. It's the Father's nature to touch you. It's the Father. Some of us need to get this mindset. We're like, God, is it your will? Is it your will? And he says, yes. Is it door number one or door number two? And the father says, yes. <laughs> but what about door number three? He's like, that one too. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. All the promises of God are yes and amen. All the promises of God. Okay, I'm just going to pick one. And I'm going to trust that you're with me, Father. I'm going to trust that you're with me. Come on. How many need to hear this right now? Because this is the Father's nature. This is the Father's nature. The Father wants sons and daughters. He's not looking for robots. He's not looking for robots. He's not looking for, for you know, people, yes, Father, I will do thy will. He's looking for people who will say, yes, because that's the Father's nature. Say, that person's hurting? Yeah, I'm going to go minister to them. I know it's the will of the Father. It's His nature. He wants to minister to people right now. Hurting people in here. Father, would you just touch people right now? Would you just reach out? Let your love come. Let your love come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Ooh, there's a wave of heat in here. It's like God's hot breath is breathing on us or something. <laughs> He's like, oh, just breathing says that when he went, fever followed him. That's what it's like when God moves. Some of us, he's going to turn up the temperature. Come on, he's going to turn up the temperature on some in here right now. Holy Spirit, come right now. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. There it is, more, Lord. More, Father. More, Father. More, Father. More Father. There's just a baptism of the Father's love right now just happening in this room right now. There he is, more Father, more Father. Let your, let your kingdom come, more Father. More Father. I don't see, you're going to get, and you're going to have an encounter with the love of God. Father's proud of you. Father's just proud of you. And the, even the struggle, you've stood your ground. 
and you've held yourself with honor. And God's proud of you. He calls you son. And he's inviting you into this place to know that he's proud of you. He's full of joy over you. And he's happy about who you are. He loves who you are. He's been, he's been walking with you for a number of years. He's been ministering to you in the secret place. And you're going to know the Father's love. Father, I bless him in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, let your kingdom come. Come, Father. More. More, Father. More, Father. Yeah, just happy Father's Day to you. More, Father. More, Father. More, Father. The Father is just, I can, he's singing over us right now. He's singing over us. Bert, I just see the Father's love on you, man, in this season of your life. And you're about to come into a season of, it's a Thanksgiving season for you and for your family. Where you're going to give thanks because the Lord is good. And I, I just see the Lord restoring to you the joy of your salvation. He's going to restore to you. It's like joy is going to fall on you and fall on all those that you touch. And he's called you to be a messenger of joy. He's called you to be a, a host of joy, a carrier of joy. He's going to cause his spirit to flow through you. Is a mantle of joy, a joy mantle going to be released on you. And I see you touching people in your life, bringing them into an encounter with the joy of the Father, the Father's joy. I see even in your house that you're going to be bringing people, many people through your house. And it's, there's going to be people of notoriety, people of nobility that will actually come through your house. And God is going to prepare your house to be a house that can host kings, a house that can host some of the world's who's who. And you're going to recognize the hand of God flowing through you and Elsie in this season. He's going to cause you to prophesy over the broken, prophesy over the weary, prophesy over those who are brokenhearted. You're going to have a strong discernment in this season, a wisdom that's going to reach beyond anything you've ever known or seen before. And I see you ministering out of this wisdom and out of this place of encounter. God's about to en line up encounters for you. You're going, to, you're going to encounter God. I see you encountering God in the secret place. And he wants to put his father love on you. He's touching your health as well. And he's going to minister to your health and he's going to minister healing to your body. He's going to minister strength to you. And you're going to begin to see God is he's adding to you many years. And he's going to strengthen you for the days ahead. I see God surrounding you even with this legacy. It's a legacy move. Surrounding you with legacy, a legacy of family, spiritual sons and daughters. And you're going to begin to see God is, he's going to set you in a place as a, a grandfather anointing. And he wants to begin to release the father's love through you in this grandfather anointing. There's also going to be. The travel is going to continue. And God is going to begin to increase you in some, some places where you're going to be going to conferences and events. I see you going to places and I see you soaking and set, getting saturated and getting trained up in your gifts. And God is going to increase the grace gifts on you in a dynamic way. The provision is going to happen 
And God is also going to add to you other entrepreneurial activities. There's entrepreneurial activities that are coming and you're going to begin to see God, even with your kids around you, that they're going to actually help you accomplish these entrepreneurial activities. And it's going to be family business. It's a legacy. It's for your family. And I bless you with that in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody celebrate God. Oh, Father, you're so good. You're so good. Isn't he good? I just feel the fathers in the house, they need blessing. They, they need blessing. This guy right here, I just see blessing on you, man. You've carried yourself well. God is, he wants to encourage you. And I, wow, I saw the Lord. Uh, he put a new song in your heart and a dance in you as well. But I see roller skates. I don't know why, but I see. The, there's also something, uh, there's a local community spot that the Lord is forming. And I see local community gatherings. And God is going to actually bring you into a place where you can host the neighborhood in local community gatherings. You're going to begin to see people come around, and it's going to be moments of barbecuing. It's going to be moments of, uh, of, of hanging out, hang times. <laughs> You're the best cook ever is what she just said. So... You're going, you're, you're going to begin to see the Lord add to you just years of joy, even in a uh, community. There's, uh, but the host, you're a, you're a host, and uh, you have the gift, gift of hospitality on you. And God is going to set you up with a hospitable anointing, uh, a, an anointing of favor, and he's going to cause your face to shine. Yep. So I bless that in Jesus' name. And I just prophesy a new grill over you. God's going to give you a new grill. In the name of Jesus, let it be so. Amen? Isn't that good? That's awesome. That's awesome. Come on. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Any dads back here? Yeah, this guy right here, come on. Man, I'm excited for you. I, I feel like the, the joy of the Lord, the excitement and the passion of God is on you. And I, I just feel this is a season where that God wants you to know that he's your protector. He's your shield. He's your exceedingly great reward. And like Abraham, he believed God and there was a... There was a legacy from his life. I prophesy legacy will come forth from you. And that you will begin to see a, a, a relationship back with your kids. That the Holy Spirit is going to give you a relationship with your kids. And it's going to be a, the, a move of God to actually begin to uh, bring back even some uh, years of brokenness. And he wants you to know that he's going to fill it with joy. He's going to smooth everything out. He's going to heal you up too. And I see him touching your shoulder. He's healing you in your shoulders. But it, I see that you're going to be carrying even not only your kids, but you're going to be carrying your, your brother. And I, I'm reminded of this song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother, that you're going to be carrying your brothers and they're going to rely on you for the strength that you have inside of you. That you have an incredible strength in you to carry people. And so watch as God begins to give you the ability to carry others. You're going to also, I see miracle worker anointing on you. I see evangelism. And others are going to, uh, God's going to pair up the prophetic gifts with this. 
And so watch as God begins to give you those. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, buddy. Bless you, man. Wow. Wow. Any other dads back here? Yeah? Come on. A bunch of dads here. Wow. Hey, man. What's your name? Brian? I see, Brian, I see on you. God has a, a there's, there's, you're multifaceted. You have a lot of different talents. And you're trying to figure out which one you should do. Uh, God's going to bring you into a, an environment where you're, all your talents are going to come together in one place. And I see, uh, I see skill, I see knowledge, and you're going to increase in knowledge. Book knowledge, music knowledge, uh, you're going to increase in knowledge of people. And he's going to fill you with wisdom beyond your years. You're going to have a gift of the word of wisdom that is going to flow through you. And so watch as God begins to give you the gift of word of wisdom. There's a lot of, uh, there's, I see you speaking life into dead people. And you're going to bring them back to life. You're going to bring them out of the chains that they've been in and bring them into a place where they can feel God's love. You're you're also, I see, God has made you a forerunner where you can, uh, you're not worried about whether or not people are going to be alongside of you in order to do something. You're a forerunner. You're, you're going to uh, break out ahead of others. And you're going to have others that will follow alongside of you and actually want what it is that you're going after. So pursue love. He says, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love and is earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. And so you're going to pursue love and, and find yourself walking in a prophetic mantle, and it's going to be the hand of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, so I bless that. Amen. Come on, I bless you fathers. Yeah. Father, I ask, ask for the Father anointing to come for these fathers. Lord, that you would begin to fill them up with the love of God. That they would represent the Father well. That generations would experience the love of the Father through them. God, let your love come. Come on, can we just lift up our voices for these fathers right now? Come on, just celebrate them right now. Celebrate them. Come on. I, I, I do want to celebrate you. I feel like God wants to celebrate you in this, uh, this season of your life. This is a season of uh, inheritance. This is a season of uh, thanksgiving. God's going to increase your land. God's going to increase you to the right and to the left. And you're going to begin to know in this time what to do with the inheritance that you've been given. And he's going to create something sustainable, a sustainable, uh, a renewable source uh, of income. And you're going to recognize that God is giving you the wisdom to do this. And he's going to put a new strength in you. It's a new dream coming. And so I bless that in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Are there any couples in here, you're, you're a father, but you want to see, you want to have babies in this season. And I, I actually, I'm not giving you just permission to have babies, but you're, you want to actually have babies and you, yeah, you, you, in, the, in the covenant of marriage, by the way. Uh, uh, and you're struggling to have babies, but we, I believe there's a, a breakthrough right now for you. I'm getting this by word of knowledge. Struggling to have babies, but uh, you can't have babies for some reason or another. God is about to break open a door right now for you. I'm telling you, it's the windows of heaven. 
Wow. Yeah. Father, do it in Jesus' name. We bless them in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody celebrate God for them right now. There's a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Ho! <laughs> we won't be having service tonight. We... <laughs> Just kidding. Would you all stand up? Thank you, Father, for this, this incredible group. Lord, what you're doing here. I love this building, by the way. I think it's God's going to fill this building with glory. He's going to fill this building with glory. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. We celebrate you, Father. And every father in here, God, put on them an anointing, grace, love, wisdom, and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I had a interesting, oh, I didn't know where that was going to go, Jamie, but thank you for keeping it conservative. Uh, so we have service tonight at 7. Uh, please invite people for our last night. And bring your best praise. Amen. We want to thank God for all that he's done. And we just want to really celebrate. So if you need to take a nap, get your energy up. If you need to visit a coffee bar, if you need to go get a triple espresso, whatever you got to do, just get your praise on tonight. Be ready to give God thanks. And uh, I just really appreciate your hunger for God. I appreciate already what God has done. He's definitely not done yet. He saves the best for last, so we just say, yes, Lord. We're going to step into all that we have. If I, I, I wanted to put out, actually, Tracy wanted to put out a challenge. If everybody in here can uh, think of one to three names, just to text and say, hey, come out here tonight. Uh, we want to kind of finish with, with a real blessing for people that haven't been here, just to step into the river and let it launch them in. In fact, somebody gave a word that there was, uh, they kept hearing these rocket sounds, uh, and uh, so there was a launching that's been taking place. So uh, tonight is about being sent out in the power of the gospel and power of the prophetic. So we're going to be uh, really laying hands and, and, and anointing you to go forth into all the world. So um, that, that's what tonight's about being sent out in the power. Same, same as Jesus breathed on the 70. They went out and then they came back like, I can't believe it worked. That's what we want to hear from you. I can't believe it worked. We have power over demons. We have power over sickness. We have power over blindness. And that's going to be awesome to hear those reports. Also, if you have a testimony, please grab something, write it down, and get it in the testimony box right there. And Tuesday, we're going to be celebrating all the powerful testimonies. And we want to be able to share those testimonies with all the guests that came and let them know some of the uh, great things that happened. Yes. The last uh, items in the bookstore for Jamie Galloway um, are right back here to the, to, on the left-hand side. First store on the left. We want you guys to be able to take materials with you so that you can uh, continuously stir up your faith and your hunger for God. All right. Denny in the coffee bar. Denny to the coffee bar. The coffee bar, car, coffee bar is calling you. God bless you. I'll see you at 7.